Welcome back. Uh, welcome back to the social business track here on Plenary 2. We'll have four Q&As together during the next hour. Uh, unfortunately, the last hour on this stage, because then we'll all, you'll all be invited to go on the main stage to do the final results of the startup competition. And our special guests, you know uh, all who this will be on, on the main stage. So we'll start um, this afternoon with a very exciting Q&A between um, uh, Brian Fitzgerald, uh, who is the uh, head of digital networking and mobilization. Just love this title. And uh, to do this Q&A, it will be Martin Bryant, who is the managing editor at The Next Web. Uh, so no more talk from me. Uh, Brian, Martin, you can join me on stage. Good afternoon. So uh, hello, Brian. How are you? Hello, Martin. Uh, so, uh, well, it's interesting. Uh, um, uh, you do some really interesting work, and I think um, there's uh, a lot that um, people here can, uh, can learn from it. So, uh, could you start by summing up uh, Greenpeace's digital strategy, its approach to digital engagement? Sure. Um, Greenpeace was actually born in the television era back in the uh, 1970s, but a surprising amount of our DNA has managed to translate into the world of digital in the era of social media. And I say that because we specialize in crystallizing debates and catalyzing discussion with big dramatic confrontations, creative confrontations. In the era of television, that would be putting a boat in front of a harpoon to save a whale. Um, taking that simple image, putting it out on television, and um, asking people to make a choice. Are you for the whales? Are you for the people who are killing the whales? And then take that public reaction, which was save the whales, and push it into the political forums where those decisions were being made. And, um, with, in the era of social media, uh, we have to add to that the creation of remarkable content. And when I say remarkable, I use it in the sense that uh, Seth Godwin uses, which is not just content that's neat, but content that is worthy of remark and that sparks a conversation, starts a debate, sometimes very uncomfortable. Um, but we like to think of empowering our supporters to be the conscience of uh, the brands that we go after sometimes. And uh, the function of a conscience is to nag. <laughs> okay, you, you mentioned uh, kind of content there that's uh, kind of really engaging and really gets people uh, interested. Uh, that sounds very similar to a lot of uh, more digital marketing that, um, that businesses would use. Uh, so uh, how do you make sure that translates not from just uh, someone clicking a petition on the internet or you know, something that's quite um, easy to do but maybe isn't that meaningful on a long-term uh, level and actually getting them out there to uh, engage with your uh, campaigns a bit more meaningfully? Yeah, um, I half agree with Malcolm Gladwell's um, critique of clicktivism, as he calls it, in that he's absolutely right that no movement has ever changed the world that was only online. It's got to be complemented with people on the street, people in their communities, people taking real risks in the real world, and that's a big part of what we are. Uh, but where I disagree is that those low barrier um, uh, asks, petition signings, the email signatures, um, sharing content that actually changes a brand's policy can be tremendously empowering and they can change people's perception uh, how they see themselves, not as a witness to problems in sustainability or environmental crimes, but actual agents of change. And when we talk about conversion rates, this is the kind of conversion we talk about, <laughs> is actually putting people into active engagement with uh, environmental problems and working to solve them. Uh, well, measurement is often um, uh, a, a topic that uh, comes up in terms of social media marketing, and uh, that's uh, something that uh, I know a lot of businesses struggle with. How do we measure the success? Uh, do you have any kind of ways that you measure your success for your campaigns? Yeah, we do. We, but, you know, we've got about 24 million subscribers, and we measure subscribers by people who have given us permission to uh, contact them, to speak to them. That could be Twitter, Weibo, Pinterest, email, uh, SMS, whatever. Tremendously passionate supporters. Um, but we're not so keen, actually, on the numeric measurements anymore. We're really looking at mobilization as moving out of the online world and starting to look at changing the relationship that we have with our supporters from one that's, you know, a relationship with us, Greenpeace, the institution, to one which is more about uh, supporter to supporter between themselves as communities, as networkers, as leaders themselves. And, um, you know, in 2011, I think we had uh, 65,000 people who volunteered, who offered to volunteer time to us. And we had to turn away 
all but 18,000 of those because we didn't have the infrastructure to support them. And that's, that's not efficient, especially for an organization which, despite the size of our brand, our uh, budgets are sometimes the size of the advertising budgets of some of the industries that we go after. We need all the help we can get. So our uh, Dutch office has piloted a, um, a uh, pro, uh, platform on Drupal Commons, which is aimed at encouraging volunteer uh, self-organization and volunteer co-creation of campaigns with us and the actual creation of their own campaigns. And this to me is the real future. It's a fantastic result. They went from, with no staff increase, they went from uh, about 100 active supporters uh, to more than 1,000, 10 activities to 60, everything from school kids doing Gangnam style uh, <laughs> flash mobs to support our Save the Arctic campaign to uh, actually successful campaigns to stop a particular herbicide use in Rotterdam. And to me, that's the future, is that moving people from the online world into the offline world and getting them talking to each other and creating their own campaigns. So is, is that the secret, in a way, to um, a lot of this kind of in, uh, encouraging people to do things offline? Is that kind of empowerment? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when you look at uh, the, the ability we've had to actually shift brands and shift policies through those social media efforts... Um, you know, that's a big buzz. People are empowered by the fact that they've seen an effect of something that's simply shared or promoted or pushed to their friends. Yeah, so uh, mobile is uh, one of the uh, trends that uh, nobody will have uh, ignored or missed over the last few years. It's uh, um, mobile first is increasingly uh, um, a, a, an approach that a lot of uh, um, entrepreneurs take to their, their products. Um, what is Greenpeace's mobile strategy? Well, I'm a big believer in what Clay Shirky said was the contribution that mobile and social media played in the, uh, in the Arab Spring. It allows uh, supporters, revolutionaries to align their opinions, to coordinate their movements, and to document um, their actions. And in particular, his point that governments don't fear informed publics, they fear uh, coordinated movements. And I would add, I mean, that's same for any uh, sort of industry target we take on, or government, is that ability to coordinate. So mobile is going to be key. I'm really keen on uh, geosocial networking, and I would love to see a, an app like uh, Badu, Highly Glancy, or, or Sonar, or one of those that is actually dedicated to Greenpeace supporters finding each other in their communities at festivals uh, rather than dating, although it might be a killer dating app as well. <laughs> yeah, um, so that, that's interesting because uh, at, at South by Southwest this year, everyone was talking about how things like Highlight, um, Glancy, which uh, is off the market now, but um, uh, those kind of apps, how they, uh, how, how they were really useful for finding people, but as yet they haven't really stuck with the mainstream audience. I mean, I, I use Highlight because it recommends people, if I'm at home, uh, which isn't a lot of tech people around, um, I'll get um, recommended someone three miles away or something. It's like, oh, I can't really meet up with them. It's different here. So you think that uh, something like applying it to uh, a campaign like Greenpeace might be a, a good way? Sure. Yeah. Hive mind for a cause. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if, if you're in that, that market, uh, maybe, maybe speak to Brian. Uh, so... Um, well, I, I put out on Twitter earlier, actually, that I was going to be uh, doing this, uh, and I uh, had a question uh, through from uh, Jolie Brearley, uh, who uh, was um, on Twitter and uh, sent this uh, question through. Do you have any good examples of digital innovation in the voluntary sector beyond Greenpeace? Um, sure. Uh, 350.org, uh, our partners in crime and fighting on uh, climate change, absolutely brilliant stuff that they've done with autonomous groups. Movember, uh, absolutely <laughs> love, you know, an idea that came out of a bar and a uh, tremendously powerful way of telling a story by, you know, getting men who may have trouble talking about prostate cancer to be able to talk about it um, and to take the story of Movember forward simply by wearing it on their face. Brilliant stuff. Yeah, um, I was hearing yesterday about someone who's a, a, a woman, obviously, um, trying to get involved in the whole Movember thing. She's raised money and is now going to have a, a moustache tattooed on her finger. So, uh, yeah, it has really engaged people that. Uh, going back to Greenpeace, then, uh, in terms of specific campaigns, uh, the one that uh, seems to have really captured people's imaginations recently has been around the detox campaign. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, detox. Uh, <laughs> unfinished business for us. This is uh, a campaign that is aimed at the textile industry, particularly. And back in the 70s and 80s, we did a lot of work to get legislation to stop hazardous waste discharges in the rivers and streams and lakes of Europe and North America very successfully. 
Um, but as a result, a lot of those industries simply moved to Mexico, to China. And today they say that you can tell what, f what color is going to be in next season um, in the fashion world by what color some of the rivers are in China. And it's not just dye that's going out there. It's um, in a, a hormone disrupting chemicals. It's a real toxic soup. It's a real problem. Um, so it's a real indicator of how things have changed. In the past, we would have gone this as, at this as a legislative issue. But when you're dealing with a close alliance of industry and government in Mexico or the difficulty in moving the government in China, we had to flip it on its head and we turned it into a supply question. We said, okay, who are the biggest buyers of these particular textiles? And do they know that there's hazardous chemicals going on in the rivers? And uh, can we get them to commit to stop buying those textiles uh, uh, by 2020? And so we launched, uh, a, well, we talked to Zara, Mango, Victoria's Secrets, all the major brands back in 2011. We weren't getting far, very far on a commitment to actually uh, adopt a zero waste uh, uh, policy. So we launched a social media campaign where we basically provided materials. Uh, we've got an anime video that's, I think, number five on one of the viral video lists today, mm -hmm. and uh, asked our supporters to push these things. We targeted Zara first and uh, mobilized our network of volunteers to go out in front of Zara stores, uh, dressed up as mannequins that were revolting and leaving the stores and creating street theater, creating pressure on the brand and creating social media pressure on the brand uh, and raising that question. Is it right for those chemicals to be going into the rivers of China and Mexico when they're banned in our own homes? And uh, tremendous response from our enthusiastic fans. They really took this and pushed it. We were aiming at fashionistas, fashion blogs, that sort of thing, the, the voices that the industry listened to. And um, it was a tremendous success. I'm glad to say that Zara, uh, last week on Monday, had a nine hour meeting and we agreed they will, in 2013, insist that all of their suppliers are transparent about what they're putting into rivers uh, in China. And this is where there's no government regula regulation requiring them to be transparent about those things. And by 2015, the worst chemicals will be gone. And by 2020, they will have a zero waste policy for all of their closing their supply chains. Mango has done the same thing. Excellent stuff. But Absolutely. Levi's has yet to agree. So if you go to www.greenpeace.org, you can join that campaign and pressure that brand. <laughs> that would be great. So brands uh, at the other end of your, uh, your campaigns um, or anyone else's campaigns, um, it's a very popular tactic to do what you do and uh, th these kind of uh, mass popular campaigns against particular brands who are perceived to be doing something wrong. Um, how should those brands react? Well, <clears throat> I've seen two extremes, and one is that uh, you embrace the change, and I, that would be my advice, Adv embrace the change. Don't try to shoot the messenger, because in most cases we've seen uh, uh, the, people, the brands that try to shoot the messenger end out with self-inflected wounds. And I think the most famous case of this is, uh, is KitKat. It's a, a story of a brand that tried to put out a social media wildfire with social media gasoline, and it just <laughs> ended up really, really ugly for them. Um, the other example is McDonald's, which responded to one of our campaigns completely positively, sat down with us, put together a consortium of soy buyers to uh, stop the Amazon being deforested, and fixed a major problem. There is maybe a difficulty though, uh, should brands just roll over and accept uh, what's happening because they don't want to get in trouble with, the, with their public because uh, there could be a campaign that while it has a, a basis in fact and a basis in uh, something that's uh, right and a good point, maybe some of the aspects of the uh, message that uh, the campaigns are putting across aren't exactly 100% fair, aren't particularly, you know, not 100% you know, the full story, if you like, and so the, the company can't just go, well, you know, fair cop, it's, you know, you've caught us. It may be more nuanced than that. Well, I think there's a tremendous responsibility on activists to ensure that they are asking for things that can be fixed, you know, mm -hmm. and we never go into a campaign where there is not a solution that can be had and that's available, and that's absolutely key, but it's also important for brands to remember, you have to value the doing the right thing. And if you're going to personalize your brand, you're going to humanify your brand, you've got to take the whole ticket. You've got to instill it with a moral compass and ethical choices, or your supporters see it as pure marketing, and all that investment is gone. Okay. And uh, it, it, it seems a little strange in a way to see Greenpeace at Le Web, uh, which to me has always been very much about entrepreneurs, about the, uh, the business sector. Uh, so why do you come to events like this and, and what do you get from it? 
No, I, I absolutely love events like this. They give me hope when I see uh, things like the, uh, the programmable thermostat from Nest and uh, you know, Scott Harrison's fantastic entrepreneurial reinvest, reinvention of the charity through Charity Water. Um, that's the kind of spirit that the world needs. World Bank just came out with a report that says we basically have uh, three decades to fundamentally change the way we feed and fuel our planet or we're going to face tremendous consequences from climate change. And that's a tremendous challenge, but for any entrepreneur, that's also a massive opportunity. And uh, if you haven't seen Steve Jobs' brilliant ad, um, uh, uh, here's to the crazy ones, it's a testament to all these uh, characters, some of whom are entrepreneurs, investors, or inventors, and activists all together. And I think our tribes have a, a common allegiance here in that we don't like rules, we, are, uh, uh, we embrace change, and we're crazy enough to think that we can change the world. And the end of the ad is simply that it's only the crazy ones that actually do. So my appeal to the entrepreneurs and the investors out there is to look at the sustainability of our planet and the challenges that it's going to face and the opportunities that provides, and let's all put our shoulders to the wheel and try to bend the arc of history towards better ways to run a planet. Okay, well, uh, that's, that's, that's a great way to end off. We are uh, out of time, but uh, very, very briefly, and are you up for direct conversations with web, web entrepreneurs who maybe want to get involved? Absolutely, anytime. Yeah. Excellent. Well, uh, Brian Fitzgerald, Head of Mobilization and uh, Digital Networking at Greenpeace, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.